Okay, good evening. Welcome to our latest webinar as part of our Head Start series. I'm pleased to say that today I'm joined by two of my colleagues that teach on a number of our courses here at Swansea University, uh, Dr. Marcella Beza Corner. Now she can uh, give you the right pronunciation, <laughs> pronunciation uh, and also my colleague, Dr. Sam Webster. So we're really pleased that they've both um, taking uh, giving up their time to take part in this webinar series this evening the topic is the heart as you know when you registered it's anatomy how it works and more so without further ado i'm going to hand over to marcella and sam who are going to kick off tonight's webinar thank you both all right should i put the pin yeah. okay good evening everyone uh, Thank you, Emma, for the introduction. So we are very pleased to welcome you from Anatomy Lab at Swansea University Medical School. And my name is Marcela Bezitskova, and here is my colleague, Sam Webster, Hello. because we are two here, so we share with the face masks. But uh, we both are senior lecturer in anatomy. Sam, on top of it, is the senior lecturer in embryology, and we teach anatomy across the university and uh, I believe I can say we both love teaching and uh, to support uh, anatomy knowledge uh, improvement with the students and also the academics and health professionals across the university and uh, to use the practical part uh, I mean to apply the practical anatomical knowledge into the uh, real life so what you can expect from our session today, as you can see, we are in a physical space. So we're going to show how we teach anatomy for our students. And uh, the topic is the heart. Uh, we are going to share different activities we use for teaching anatomy here at the moment in this setting, which is the, uh, which is the amazing setting from Sam. He is a kind of the technology technology bizarre, which we are really cherish because uh, we can just use models and the practical teaching over here. Uh, firstly, I will introduce a little bit about what programs we participate in. And Sam is going to say something about the, uh, how we teach anatomy now and how we used to teach before the pandemic. And we hope we're going to be back in this design as soon as possible. Fingers crossed. So um, before we start um, to talk in an intro, I would like you to do a little bit, because I'm a little bit nosy. We wanted to know what uh, anatomical topic, that one, yeah. What anatomical topic are you interested in? This is a kind of the question. Yeah, you can, use your phones or iPads or whatever. So I will leave this uh, question open. It's through Mentimeter we use for teaching as well. So if you can just type in your answer and we can just have a look later on. Now, if you can, if you can sign in, thank you for, for, for writing it in a chat, but if you can sign in into the menti.com. Right, yeah, okay. menti.com. As you can see here, I can show you here, and there is a code. If you go to the website menti.com and you will use the code, you will see the question on your phone and you can type in the answer. Yeah. So we can just have a look all together what kind of the topics you are interested in. Hope this makes sense. If you have any questions, just put it in chat so we can answer it uh, through the session. All right. So the heart, its anatomy, how it works and more. As I said, firstly, we would like to talk a little bit like an intro, what we do here at Swansea uh, when teaching anatomy. So as you can see, so we, we teach a couple of programs uh, starting with the undergraduate uh, programs as applied medical science program, uh, which I'm a module lead. 
uh, the graduate and trial medicine program, which is a core teaching of anatomy for us. Sam is the lead for that program. And we also participate with the, in the postgraduate programs as a nanomedicine or physician associate. As we both are passionate about the anatomy and enhancing and supporting all the others. So we also organize the extracurricular dissection courses and tutorials and workshops uh, for health professionals, for our colleagues, academics and the wider audience if desired. So I think that's all from me. So Sam, yeah. up to you now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm <laughs> teaching on an ENT thing after this later tonight. Yeah. Um, <laughs> It never ends. So this is what we normally do. Um, we try to teach, as Marcy said, in a practical way. So we've got, you can see this one lab space here. Um, you can see a little bit of the room. It's got various bits, we've got loads of plastic models in here. So you can see like half of the room there. The room behind, that one there is the prosection room where we keep all our human tissue. Um, so we've got cadavers in there and pre-prepared stuff. We've got another lab twice the size of this over there. And we've got a couple of other small rooms. So normally we teach like this. We, we take our say hundred students and split them into five groups. And each one of those groups will have a different teacher. We'll have um, an anatomist like me or Marcy who can be expected to roll up and teach anything. We'll have a surgeon that's usually really specialized in that area, that stuff that we're teaching um, on that day. Um, but they'll be teaching in a very clinical way, a very relevant way. Um, and then we'll have a radiology station every week in GEM, for example, we have radiology teaching. So we're getting students used to thinking about the three-dimensional structures of the body, relating those to radiology, because clinically that's how they're going to see most of the anatomy. They're going to be poking people um, using their surface anatomy and looking at radiology. And then on top of that, we'll have various other health professionals. If we're doing musculoskeletal stuff, we'll have physiotherapists because they're fantastic with musculoskeletal stuff. When we do the oral cavity, we'll have a dentist in. Uh, when we do swallowing, we have a speech therapist and all sorts of things like that. And then we'll often also have a pathologist. So although a lot of the time we're looking at the gross anatomy of the human body, we also need to consider the cellular structures, the histology, the, the microscopic anatomy of the body, because the microscopic anatomy sets us up for the gross anatomy. It's all one thing. It's just our eyes that limit what we can see and what we can perceive. So we get the histologists to talk about how the cells are organized normally and then consider what happens when abnormal things happen. So we relate the, the microscopic structure to the gross structure. It's anatomy as a whole. All right. Um, should we go to the... Yeah. yeah. All right. So demo. At the moment, we can't do that. We can't have 100 students in here. Um, so we have all the students at home, which I think they love because on a Monday morning, they probably stay in bed with a cup of tea and don't bother switching their cameras on. Uh, and they don't actually have to travel into campus. <laughs> but we deliver a live session with those same experts, us anatomists, surgeons, radiologists, and what have you. We come in and we teach, just like we're doing it now, through the camera to students at home. And what we've done is we've set up various bits and bobs. So. People can plug in their laptops. They can still use the plastic models. They can teach anatomy in a practical way. And the students can ask good questions and the clinicians will give good answers. And it's a rounded live session, hopefully. So how does this work? Well, you know, it's usually a little bit of a hodgepodge, but it kind of works. So if we're talking about the heart, we would, we would focus on the heart. Foc there we go, focus on the heart. Um, so we did introduce the heart. We can see the thoracic cavity here. Here's the liver. Here are the lungs. Take out the lungs. Most of our models are a little bit different, so we can show slightly different things. But here, if we take out the lungs, you can now see the diaphragm separating the thoracic cavity from the abdominal cavity. And you can see the heart is resting on the central part of the diaphragm. This is kind of what we call a, a tenderness part. So obviously, as the diaphragm moves up and down, that means the heart's going to move up and down and the liver's going to move up and down. So everything's moving. Um, the lungs then are tightly packed up against the heart on either side. And we can see some major blood vessels here. So we can see 
On the right side here, we've got the superior vena cava. So we've got blood from the upper limbs, the head and neck is coming down into the heart on this side. And then if we were to lift the heart up, we can see the inferior vena cava here. So blood is coming up from the abdomen, up, up from the abdomen, the pelvis, the lower limbs, up through the inferior vena cava. If we, if we were to take the liver out, we can see that the liver is actually surrounding this huge vein, this inferior vena cava, as the blood passes back up to the heart. So we see these major vessels. So what we're doing is we're, we're orienting the heart, orienting ourselves and seeing what's attached to it. Here, so if that's the superior vena cava, here's the aorta, the major artery that's gonna curve around posteriorly and a little to the left side of the body. And we see some major branches running off it to supply blood to the head and neck and the upper limbs, but the rest of the aorta then descends through the thorax next to the esophagus and into the abdomen onto the rest of the body. So that leaves this blood vessel here. So that blood vessel, if I take this out and we focus on it, because <laughs> my focusing on the zoomed in. Yeah, I can do that when demonstrating the heart later. <laughs> yeah, sure. But oh, so this blood vessel here, if we tilt it up, we can see that it splits to give off two blood vessels to the left and right. And it's blue, which isn't a clue, but those two blood vessels go to the two lungs. So those are the pulmonary arteries. This is the pulmonary trunk giving off the pulmonary arteries to the heart. Um, it's blue because the, the blood is poorly oxygenated, but arteries leave the heart and veins return to the heart. And then the last couple of bits, the chambers of the heart. So the... I will talk about You're it. You're going to talk about those in detail. You just okay. want me to do the position. Yeah, the position of the heart. There we go. Yeah. So they, you, they can see it better in this bigger ones, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I can open it, thing. you know. So the heart is central in the thorax. It's posterior to the sternum. I'm tapping my mic, sorry. Um, and it projects a little bit to the left. And you can see that it's about the size of a fist. So that's its position. All right, Marcy. You can, you can just show the sternum here, maybe. Sternum, yeah, where approximately the heart. He's tall. This guy. He's this is taller than I am. He's, he's a very tall one. This <laughs> one. So we're up in up in here. It's, the heart is mostly posterior. It's the sternum projects a little bit to the left side, but it's it, otherwise it's pretty central. All right. right. Okay. Yep. Cool. Thank you, Sam. So I go, so I go for the. For yeah. the if you can swap from the... Do, do. do you want to put it over yeah, there? Yeah, yeah, if you can just put it there sure. so I can I can see... You can see what you're doing. Uh, what they see, actually, How's which that? is better. All right. What do you think? Is all right? Yeah. Okay. So, as Sam said, so it's a, like a cone-shaped muscular pump, which is pumping the blood uh, in and out. And as you can see here, this is the inferior part of the heart. So it sits down and it's the, the apex. Yeah, it's a little bit shifted to the left and down. The wider part of the heart here, if I can just show it there. So this is the base of the heart where more or less the vessels enters or leaves the heart. Yeah, so this is the wider part, which is shifted to slightly to the right and posteriorly. When we look at the heart itself, so the heart is placed in a mediastinum, that's the space. So you have the, the surface which may face forward, as some said. So in front of this, you will find the sternum and the ribs. If I turn the model here to the inferior surface, so if I just turn it like this, you can see it's quite flat because it sits on the diaphragm. So it sits like this on the diaphragm, if, I can, if you can see it, yeah. It, it's quite difficult to show it all with the camera because, you know, so we use the models and students can handle it and turn it around to see it. So anyway, it's better than using only the pictures. So when we talk about the heart itself, it, it is divided into, we can say right heart, 
and left heart. Yeah. So you see the groove here, which is on the surface, and this groove descends inside the heart and actually separates the right side of the heart and the left side of the heart. We call it septum. So this part is the right one. This one is the left one. And as you can see, so vessels related to the right heart are blue. And that's because there is a deoxygenated blood coming into the heart. As some said, this is the superior vena cava and inferior vena cava and travels through the right atrium on the top, pass through the atrioventricular uh, opening, where is the tricuspid valve with three cusps, travels into the ventricle. So if you remember, the atrium is something for the entrance. So the heart enter, uh, the blood enters into the atrium and then it goes into the ventricle. The ventricle is the, the part which actually works and pumps the blood out from the heart. And as you can see, this blue vessel is called pulmonary trunk, which divides into the pulmonary arteries. And this is the pulmonary circulation. So deoxygenated blood from the right heart travels into the lungs to get the oxygen. As we said, there is the tricuspid valve. That's because to to close the opening between the atrium and the ventricle. There must be also the valve, which we call pulmonary valve, which protects the backflow of the blood from the vessel when the ventricle is dilated. Yeah. So this is the right side, right atrium, tricuspid valve, and then the right ventricle. When we turn to the back, so we have another cha chamber where actually blood comes from the lungs, as you can see the red color through the pulmonary veins, which is a little bit difficult to explain why these are the veins and these are the arteries, but that's another topic. But from the pulmonary veins, oxygenated blood comes into the left atrium. Then it travels through the atrioventricular opening here. There is the mitral valve or bicuspid because of two cusps, travels into the left ventricle. And this is the hard working part of the heart because it pushed the blood into the largest vessel of the human body, which is the aorta. So it actually distributes the blood into all the tissue around. As you can see, the wall of the heart, so is formed by the myocardium, which is specialized muscle, which is also containing the specialized tissue, which able, enable the heart beating, so to contract the myocardium. But what I wanted to say is to thickness of the wall. You can see this is the right ventricle, this is the left ventricle. So the left ventricle might be four times thicker, maybe. Sure. Yeah, so because okay. it is pumping the blood against the greatest pressure, greater pressure than the left one, the, the right one, sorry. The right goes just into the lungs, but the left one must go into the whole body. If you can see from the bottom, there must be also a valve which protects the uh, backflow, so-called regurgitation. So this is the aortic valve. So we have the pulmonary valve and the aortic valve here. Does this make sense? Hopefully, some. Anything else we wanted to? Nope. Nope. I might just show you another model uh, here. As I spoke about the myocardium and the conducting system of the heart. So you see the yellowish bundles in between the muscle layer. This is the specialized myocardium, which actually allows the heart beat even outside the body. They only need the oxygen supply. So there is the, the main pacemaker, the sinoatrial node, which makes the contraction of the heart. So the heart contracts and sends the impulses through it. That's it.
okay. think. Coronary arteries? Yep, coronary arteries. Oops. With a little <laughs> <brain. laughs> My thought. <laughs> My camera's gone dark. It's always like this. Okay, one other thing. Um, for you guys. Have you used uh, Kahoot before? Kahoot. Lovely. Just prepared for later. Yeah, that's for later. So I am curious about a topic they would like to know more. So we're going to do a Kahoot quiz later, see how much of that you took in. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, so you can either play Kahoot through a web browser. So if you've got a spare web browser, go to kahoot.com. But if you want to, you can also play on your mobile device, your tablet, your iPad, your phone, Android, iOS. Go to the relevant app store, search for Kahoot, download that and install it. If you want to, you don't have to. How are the yellow vessels called? So those vessel, those yellow structures, those were uh, nerves. So we have the sinoatrial yeah. node, the, I'm going to show that. Yeah. So what we've got here. We, uh, so this, the, um, we have a connection between the sinoatrial node up. See, he wants to, he wants to focus on my face. <laughs> if you want to, I can show it here, maybe. There we go, see? If you see? want me. So, um, up in the right atrium, we've got the sinoatrial node. Like Marcy said, that's the pacemaker of the heart. So there are cells that depolarize. They'll probably do about um, 80 beats per minute, I think. So you could take the heart out, keep it happy, stick it in some nice fluid. We used to do this in, <laughs> in degree, sticking ringers fluid, and the heart would sit there and happily contract on its own. Uh, and the external nervous system can affect that rate, so your heart can beat faster or slower. But the yellow fibers you can see there are a connection to what's called the atrioventricular node. And then we have Purkinje fibers carrying the contract, carrying the nerve impulse down to the apex of the heart, so that it actually it, it contracts from the bottom up. And uh, whilst we see lovely heart animations on the web and in complete anatomy stuff, it's more like, like a ringing action. <laughs> it's like a, it like rings the blood out of it. All right. Anyway. I should have gone to the should have gone to the big camera there, shouldn't I? I can have a look for the yeah. Amateur, sure. we've only been doing this for a year. Um, right. So another method of uh, another method of teaching is to use CG anatomy. As Marcy was saying, um, it's the best way to learn anatomy is in three dimensions. We know that it really, really helps if students can look at the three-dimensional thing with two eyes and it's properly in three dimensions, but we can't do that because you're looking at a flat screen. It's the thing with our students um, when we're teaching on Mondays, Tuesdays and Wednesdays. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to get 3D stuff across. Um, one of the other things we can use are 3D anatomy applications like this. This is visible body. We have a subscription for all our students at the moment to complete anatomy, which is very similar. Um, I like this just because I've been using it for longer. So um, this is what we would call an anatomy atlas. We've got pretty much the entire human body in here and it's interactive so we can click on things and uh, we get names, we get information and that's, yeah, it's pretty awesome. So we use these a lot in normal teaching. So we've obviously started using these when students are at home. So. I need to dissect a little bit. So actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the whole skeleton away because I put the skeleton on there so you're oriented, so you can see where we were, you can see the sternum. And now you can see the heart, you can see all those vessels we've been talking about and many, many more. And our year two students that are just coming to the end of their anatomy teaching in graduate entry medicine, they know everything now. They can identify all of these. And it took them a couple of years. I should post this. <laughs> they know everything. I, I told them they know everything and they're going to demonstrate that to me in their next exam. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, so I'm going to take a few things away here, take a few of these other vessels, just tidy up a little bit. This is way quicker than doing it in on real cadavers. Um, okay, so we can see the heart, but something else we can see, we can see these really important vessels here, these coronary arteries. So this is a great way of teaching the anatomy of the coronary arteries. 
Um, the coronary artery is obviously really important because while some of the heart may get some of its oxygen and nutrients from the blood that's passing through it, the, the muscle uses too much energy, too much oxygen to rely on that. So it has coronary arteries that also supply blood to the muscle. And as the heart beats for your entire life without stopping, hopefully, um, you need these coronary arteries to work well and unceasingly. Um, so here's the aorta. And we can't quite see everything, so we need to dissect. But the coronary arteries come from the aorta. There are left and right coronary arteries. And we always talk about patient's left and patient's right. So this, whoop, no, this is the right coronary artery here. So that's coming out of the aorta. Ooh, it's hidden away in there, but we'll have a look in a moment. And you can see that it's curving around in between the right atrium and the right ventricle. So it's in this groove here and it gives off a number of branches. In fact, that branch there is probably gonna supply blood to the sinoatrial node. Well, no, it's, no, it's that one there, that little ditty there. Anyway, as it goes, it sends off branches and these branches are quite variable. You look at 10 people's hearts and each one will be a little bit different. And we follow it around. So we're curving around inferiorly and we can see that it gives off, in this case, this posterior interventricular branch. We're on the underside of the heart, the inferior surface of the heart. And again, we've got a little groove there. You can kind of see that by the shading and some of the shape there and the fact there's a little groove between the left and right ventricles. So there's the right coronary artery continuing on and giving off this posterior interventricular branch. Now, how far does that go? Well, it kind of goes to the tip, but doesn't go all the way around. That's interesting. Okay, zoom back out. Now, where is the left coronary artery? Hmm, it's hidden. That's not, that, 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 oh, that it, it, there it is. Yeah. That there isn't it. That says it's the anterior interventricular branch. Okay, what about around here? Now that isn't it, that's the circumflex branch. So we can't see it. So we'll need to cut away the pulmonary trunk. Ah, there it is. So the left coronary artery, you can see quite well there, hopefully, how it's coming out of the, the aorta. Mm -hmm. So there's the left yes. coronary artery and it's hidden. It's posterior to the pulmonary trunk that we've now removed. And if I make the left atrium see-through, you can see that the left coronary artery is actually it's quite short and it branches into two other arteries pretty much before you can see it. And this is one of the really important ones. So we're looking at the anterior surface of the heart here. You see where we are still. So that artery is the anterior interventricular um, coronary artery or the anterior inter interventricular branch of the left coronary artery. So it's between the two ventricles. It's running in a little groove there. When we dissect, this thing's covered in fat and we have to dig it out a little bit to find it. This also gets called the left anterior descending artery by surgeons. It's the LAD. It's, um, it's often a big part of their work. If this artery gets blocked, you can see how it is not only supplying blood to a large region of the heart, but it's supplying blood in particular to the... To the to the left ventricle. As Marcy said, the left ventricle is doing most of the work, pushing the blood all the way around the body. So if this blood, blood vessel gets occluded, then that thick ventricular muscle on the left side is gonna have less oxygen. It's gonna have less glucose. It's gonna have a problem. And that could lead to that muscle stopping working. Um, now, in some cases, the reason I was interested in this posterior interventricular artery is that that artery, the posterior interventricular artery, sometimes joins up with the anterior interventricular branch. So that would mean if you had a blockage here, blood can actually come from the right coronary artery around the tip of the heart and still supply blood to the muscle in this region. You wouldn't be very happy, but you wouldn't be dead probably. So <laughs> we have a lot of, um, we've got a lot of real hearts that we keep in the prosection lab and when we look at the coronary arteries we look for these slight variances because when our students are working clinically they need to consider 
all these varieties. And if they're looking at, say, an angiogram, which would be a radiograph of all these blood vessels, they need to consider what the normal shape looks like and look for narrowings and blockages so they can work out what's causing the symptoms in the patient that's led them to the clinic. All right, so that's one branch. So remember, we're looking at the left coronary artery there. And we see that one branch is the anterior interventricular branch or the left anterior descending, the LAD. The other branch is, let me take away that, is the circumflex branch. Now, I've got a lot of pulmonary vessels here as well. Let's, <laughs> let's take away the pulmonary stuff so this is a bit clearer. All right. How am I doing for time, Marcy? Uh, one, two minutes. I'm rambling yeah. on, am I? As yeah, <laughs> yeah so, I know. There's a lot of stuff, isn't it? <laughs> no, I just like rambling. Um, so the left coronary artery then also gives the circumflex branch and the circumflex branch is going to wrap around the left side of the heart again in that groove between the left atrium and the left ventricle and it's going to get around to the, the posterior side of the heart there. So these coronary arteries are arranged in a crown around the heart which is why they're called coronary arteries and they supply blood to the heart and if we were teaching this we'd also talk about the veins and we'd talk about we'd talk about a lot, of, a lot of other stuff as well. We'd have a lot more detail because, yeah, we'd have three hours to do this in. For you guys, <laughs> you've only got like 45 minutes. All right, any right. questions about all of that? So you might, can you swap for the, for the visualizer? I can yep. show them the coronary arteries to compare. Sure, so we can see the same yeah. thing on the models. So, so you, well, so that, that's exactly what I wanted to say. So, so to compare, um, mask off, sorry. No, it's probably better. So as you, as you saw, some was using the visible body. So you can see quite nicely a lot of tiny branches, which is not possible to see. Even the starting here from the, uh, the uh, left coronary artery. So you saw that some was able to chop it. So you can see only the rough, not much details on the models. But what is also appreciated is that you see kind of the topography of the artery. So you can, you can quite nicely see, and if you would be able to touch it, so you see that there is a groove, uh, actually the anterior interventricular branch down, goes down, yeah. So also in this case, there is the anastomosis. Um, hey, that's good uh, one. Here we go. And then you see the posterior branch, you see the circumflex one, yeah. So that, there is a couple of things uh, you, oh, this is the right one, not, post, not circumflex, circumflex is on the other way, round, yeah, on the left side. So uh, that's why we use so many uh, resources at the moment to just make it easier to understand, uh, because as you probably know, anatomy is a 3D subject and it's essential to have a practical uh, experience. All right. All right. Fine. So we swap for the for the Mentimeter now, and then we go for the Kahoot. Mentimeter. Right. So there was a question there about. Um, mm -hmm. boom, 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 boom. Question: there, Is it possible in Swansea University after finishing the AMS program and then studying medicine to then become a surgeon? Yep. Yes. Once you study medicine, you can do anything. To be honest, uh, um, when I'm teaching AMS students, it's really lovely to see them in a gem program. There is a couple of students I already know for three years and they will come to gem program. So that, that's, uh, that's one of the pathway for the medical, the medical school, the uh, applied medical science program. All right. So what anatomical topic are you interested in? The circulatory system, respiratory, cardiovascular heart, brain, brain and nerve. Oh, lovely. So who is interested in a brain? You are very brave because that's a very difficult topic, but very interesting. Yeah, most of the, of the people are interested in the cardiovascular. The heart is quite essential because it actually feeds the brain as well with the oxygen. So it's essential. Uh, the heart is working well. Brain, brain learn about different systems, in particular immune system. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. So as far as I can see, so we chose a good topic because they are interested in the heart. <laughs>
thank you very much for those who just uh, uh, answered the question. Um, this is also one of the uh, uh, tools we use for the students, especially when we want to know what they want to recap, what they, what they find difficult, and we can just use these answers for doing the revision next week, for example, when we having a session regularly, or we can do the drop-in session as well. So that's one of the tools we use for kind of the feedback and the communication interaction with the students. Another one is coming through Kahoot. Yeah, so yeah. gives us feedback on what, whether anybody learned anything, yeah. Yeah, right. Are doing Kahoot now? Yes. All right. Um, brain, so neuroanatomy. And far, far away, so you can put your mask off. We'll do. <laughs> Brain is the future of anatomical research because we don't know as much as we'd like. We don't know as much as you think. <laughs> All right, so get your Kahoot's ready, get your Kahoot app, get a Kahoot browser. Zoom have been promising for us for ages to have the two things integrated so we can just do it in Zoom, but they haven't actually done that yet. Um, but it would make life a lot easier. So. Kahoot.com will get your Kahoot app if anybody's managed to do that and put in the code 4025824. And don't feel like you have to put in your real name, put in an, an, an anonymous name. Uh, and we encourage our students to do that as well. We like these quizzes to be anonymous. We don't, um, we're not capturing anything, we're not measuring anything, we're not re recording anything. We just want to, this gives the teacher feedback as exactly. to what went well, what the students got from the session and what they didn't. And it gives the students feedback as to what they should be able to do, what level they should be at, the sort of questions that might come up and that sort of thing, right? right. Um, in fact, our position associate students this year have got really good at uh, using puns for their Kahoot names. So good, in fact, that we started a new podcast and we used one of their puns as the title of the podcast, Dissectable Me. <laughs> uh, that's another challenge five minute anatomy snippets which is really difficult because none of us could talk about anything anatomical for less than five minutes so it's a bit of a challenge all right 14. 14. how many people have we got here take 23 including three of us should i sign in as well no don't you cheat. <laughs> I'm sure you do some of these when you're at home watching no, the Zoom no. sessions. No. Oh. Okay, 15. That's a nice number. Time for time. All right, so, okay, I'm going to give you a countdown. So if you're desperately trying to get in, you've got five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one, start. And I'm probably going to have to move my face again. Okay. Five questions I think I've got here. Boom, boom, boom. My face goes up there. Identify the structure indicated by the arrow. Look carefully. Oh, if it's going to load. There we go, it's loaded. There you go, you see how it works. Yeah. It's a multiple choice question. Very good. Very um, good. And you get more points That's for speed, cool. but to be honest, in anatomy, accuracy trumps speed. Um, so yeah, this is the superior vena cava, bringing blood into the right side of the heart. Very good. Okay, and of course we get have a scoreboard and you know, students can be a little bit competitive too. <laughs> Identify the part of the heart indicated by the arrow. Oh. Oh, oh nice. well done. We don't just use these on Zoom, we use these when we have live face-to-face -face teaching as well. Um, in fact, with, with Zoom, we worry that this is often a little bit blurry for people, but still, it's worth trying. Right atrium, very good. Whenever we use left and right, we're thinking about the patient's left, patient's right. Three, identify the valve indicated by the arrow.
Yeah, gets harder, doesn't it? Yeah, Got to be really difficult. careful. So yeah, and this is again, it's very three dimensional that image, isn't it? So we need to work out where we are. So we're in the left ventricle here. And that I don't know why I've got a magnifying glass here. Um, but that is the valve that's letting blood out of the left ventricle through the aorta. So it is the aortic valve. Four. Blood passes from the chamber indicated by the arrow into which structure? So that outlined chamber there. That's a tricky question. Yeah, oh, very good. Good. Again, so anatomy is very much about recognition and recall and three dimensions. So this is the right side of the heart. This is the right ventricle. Here's the right atrium up here. And you can see that blood is passing out through this blue vessel here, painted blue because the blood is deoxygenated, but it's an artery. So the blood from the right ventricle is passing to the lung. Yes. Oh, that's a that's a strong, strong, strong lead. Five, yeah. identify the artery indicated by the arrow. <laughs> See, it's easy when you know, isn't it? Oh, it's easy brilliant. when you know. It's a coronary artery and it's on the right side and it's in that in that groove, that sulcus oh, really between good. the atrium and the whoops, between the atrium and the ventricle. So this is the right coronary artery coming around here, yeah. The anterior interventricular coronary artery is over here. Yeah, very good. All right, let's see what the scores are. Of course, this probably doesn't reflect what we've just done. This probably reflects what you already know. I don't know. <laughs> um, but still, oh. it's good feedback to us as yes. to, you know, how Five our audience is doing. Oh. Five Congratulations. Five. Too easy. Too easy. <laughs> All right. So I hope you enjoy. We hope you enjoy it. The taste session. So we hand over to Emma. Is it all right? Fantastic. Thank you both. That was, well, I learned a lot, <laughs> although yeah. I don't think I did very good on the quiz, but I did try, but I, I thought that was fascinating and, and great for those that are joining us live. So thank you to everybody who's logged in this evening. We hope you found that really informative um, and a big thank you to Marcella and Sam uh, for putting this session on tonight for us. As we said, those of you that are joining us live, um, we do have a couple of minutes left and we're going to, we'll open it up to questions if you do have any questions for both Marcella and Sam however those of you that are joining us on record I'm about to end the recording so just to say if you've got additional questions um, that you'd like to get in touch with us about then please email us and that email address to use is study at swansea.ac.uk